Hey, everybody, this is Christian Buckley with another post Collab Talk Tweet Jam uh, summary and interview. And I'm here today with Eli. Hey. Hey, Finally. how you doing, Christian? We've tried to, I've tried to get Eli in a number of these and it's never worked out with our schedules, but uh, it worked. It's, it's, it's a bad hair day or a bad pajama day, or it's a, uh, uh, a meeting immediately following or God knows what. Well, this is, a, it was a good topic. And I know that goes back for both of us with our SharePoint roots and kind of everything else. I, I, it's a, it was a, uh, you know, as I expected, it, we had a great dialogue, some, a bunch of Microsoft people on there. I know they were really interested in question number seven. We'll come back to that. Uh, but the topic today was, uh, where are the, the list here? Oh, yeah. Oh, the Let's need for community management and governance. I was trying to find the exact wording. Uh, yeah. Precisely. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and that governance and community mix. I mean, today the conversation uh, was really about managing all communities, not just your social communities. So it was an interesting slant to things. Well, why, don't you, why don't you introduce yourself first? Let's start there. Sure. Hey, my name's Eli. Hello, world. And uh, I'm coming at you from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I'm a solution architect. I freelance and uh, predominantly with clients in Toronto, Ontario, New York, and New Jersey. So uh, in the COVID world, it's been uh, much more focused on Canada and uh, Toronto, of course. Um, but it, in past, I've I, developer roots as far back as ASP.NET was, uh, helped get a group called the ASP Insiders going years and years back. And uh, from there, moved over to SharePoint and now Office 365, now Microsoft 365 and Power Platform. You know, there's a large group of folks that are in the community that I just kind of put in that bucket of kind of the decade. I've known people for about a decade. Right. You know, <laughs> kind of you know, from those those events. For some reason, there was that... I think it was SharePoint Conference 2009, where I like the majority of people that I still interact with week after right. week, but all got to know each other at that event. So and even yeah, that's it's right because there was this group at about 07, just before the launch of uh, SharePoint 2007, um, and I'm trying to remember was that at the end of 06, 07, where it was. So I was know, I was at Microsoft when that happened. So I was at those first two SharePoint conferences that were there in in the Seattle area, but as an employee, so. Right, and, and and I'm thinking of the one that was, you know, where we went across to City Hall to have lunch. You know, there were maybe a few hundred people there. It was mainly sales and marketing, but it was really before the modern era, so to speak. And then the next year it all exploded because devs were added to this thing. And right. suddenly it wasn't uh, sales and marketing. It became a heavily male demographic again, <laughs> unfortunately. Right. Yeah. And we're finally happily seeing that is starting to shift back again. But yeah, it, it's true. It, it was that time and it's it's uh, getting along 12, 13 years. As, as you were saying today, it's been nine years of collab talk. Right. Well, it's you know, it's interesting too is that in the – so as an employee, um, I didn't do a session at the SharePoint conferences. I was over helping run the hands-on labs uh, both times – uh, but in internal m people that know kind of the Microsoft you know, ecosystem, so they do their internal conference. It used to be uh, uh, you know ready, the ready event. Right. I don't know if they've rebranded things you know since then. But I, I did presentations as an employee um, with Joel Olson and with Mike Watson and with Bill Bear, um, largely around governance. So funny, um, back in two thousand six, seven, and eight. Is that amazing? Uh, yeah. So. It's just is crazy. So well, let's jump in. So question number one, um, how important is it to actively manage community activities within enterprise collaboration? And I mean, my thoughts here. So a little bit of background is, is my answer sometimes take. Um, there's an awesome book called Organized for Complexity. I'm just going to shill for this fellow, Niels Flagging, um, that really redefines how I look at organizations. You know, it, it, it's sort of how do I understand in order to react to and, and, and set good processes and governance for what they do in in the book is uh, three influential networks that you need to be aware of. You have your org chart, which is really exists for compliance and governance. It's reporting, it's checks and balances, it's making sure that reports get filed and, and, and regulatory compliance happens. Then you have your value chain where the work actually gets done. This is your product. These are the groups that are closest to your customers. And those communities are incredibly important because sometimes, you know, working with a lot of pharmaceutical organizations where, where much of their sales will be external. You know, their companies just set up to handle sales for this. Anyway, however you deal with them, 
it's uh, 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 it's it's both a community outreach and that um, edge of your organization that communicates out. Very important communities and, and sometimes difficult to manage. And then you have these social groups, your influencers, and this decides how people are going to react to change inside the company. And that's what I really thought the focus of today was about was these communities. Let's 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 right. say these these user yeah. communities. And so it's super important not only to recognize them, but especially during COVID now and work from home, the one group that gets shut out of these because, you know, the org chart is about regulate, regulatory and compliance and, 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 and metadata. And uh, the sales group is, is trying to struggle on with the value chain. But it's the social groups and how people are going to react to changes, how they're going to react to work from home, how they're going to react to tools, whether they're going to resort to Skunk Works and Slack or whether they're going to use Teams. And so um, it, it's it's super important. It's 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 every important because it, it's the one group that you can so easily miss miss in this uh, last year in, in in this. Well, it's interesting. Some some of the other questions we're going to get into some of the you know thoughts on best practices, things around it. I think that there's there's a lot of overlap between the first uh, couple of questions. Um, so this, the second one is uh, where do you draw the line between lockdown and mm-hmm. completely, completely open? in managing enterprise collaboration because that's a lot of companies almost treat it like it's it, it's a switch it's either you know <laughs> let everybody do whatever they want or completely lock down Clamp. and <laughs> and usually uh, my experience is both are wrong there that's needs right. to be something exactly. i would say on the open end of the spectrum but there have to be some uh, you know governance policies and procedures in place I mean, the thing about value chain, especially, I mean, it's where you need the most openness and the most creativity because this is your product. This is your response to customers. This is where people need to to pivot on a dime and, and respond to changing conditions. Um, and so for those people, you don't want a bunch of governance around creating new sites. You want Emergency Measures Act inside the organization so that with COVID hits and tomorrow we have to lock down and work from home, we can adapt and at least have a plan for it. Um, so, so, it, it, and then you have that regulatory group that says, yeah, we need to have DLP to make sure that we aren't leaking secrets. Um, right. and, and DLP turns out to be a fantastic tool, uh, not only for those, uh, you know, regulation and compliance, but just, you know, whether, whether it's a, a swear index or, uh, uh, you know, what, what other, other kinds of controls you want to put on this, it's a tool that I don't think people understand how powerful it can be for that. Well, there's this middle aspect- room. You, I think this it's applicable here, and and you you talked about it too. It, it it kind of goes back to your earlier point of like knowing your audience, knowing the community. Nobody really, not that I saw, maybe I missed something, but nobody really talked about some of the differences uh, between uh, internal only versus hey, we've got external folks in there. So that's where that really stands out. Is yeah. hey, are we talking about sensitive topics? Are we are you know, talking about intellectual property? Like who's actually in this space? Who's that's aware? Right. That's one of the things I love that that while it adds more, you know, things to the user interface, like within Teams, but where I know it's very clear when I'm participating in conversations or I, I join a channel or something that it's clear to me that there are external people that are involved there, and I see that in Outlook now, um, so that 100 we know how to how to do, uh, you know what standards to hold ourselves to. And these visual cues that we, you know, learn to put in, in in place in SharePoint sites, you know, this is external. You're dealing with publicly stated things, and so what you can reveal or 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 disclose becomes different than what we do on internal only sites. Back to the idea of having, you know, this this edge communities that are talking to customers, and put and 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 your pipeline, and understanding that. You know, maybe uh, whether it's NDA it covers the content, whether something else. You need you need at least to have in mind exactly who your audience is and what's appropriate for the thing and make that clear. I, I, I very much believe in this, you know, custodian model of if I let my owners understand what's appropriate, then I've delegated much of that. And I only need to deal with problems as they arise and have a, have a system for that. What I talked about the, like the guide rails. I love that yeah. idea of the guide rails as somebody else had shared one of the tweets um, about uh, like bowling with the guards up just because <laughs> right. you've got the guards up on the side doesn't mean that you're going to hit a strike. You right. know, it keeps you from going in the gutter. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I like question three again, overlap here, but you know, yep. what should 
community management and governance look like within enterprise collaboration. I, I was hoping to get some insights into what people are actually doing boots on the ground within their organizations. You know, but so what what should it look like? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's got to start with the governance. It's got to start with the policies and the, and the you know, the, 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 what, what absolutely needs to be constrained and what doesn't. And, and for what doesn't, make it as open and as free as possible. Get rid of the guardrails. We, we you know, going back 15 years to, in early SharePoint sites, very large, you know, Fortune 10 company and wanted a, an approval process and very quickly, it it became obvious that it was just getting in the way of work and they wanted to just spin stuff up. And so we got into this idea of pre-creating sites and I'd ask forgiveness, not permission, basically, so that if something was reviewed in the first week and deemed inappropriate, you know, or, or redundant, you could roll it back, but let people do what they're going to do. And, and it becomes monitoring and management and less so let's constrain what they can do out of the box, right? Yeah, let them let them let them let them get into trouble. And and if something goes wrong, you don't have to name names, but make those failures public so that everybody else can learn from them. Right. I, I used to use a, an example and people didn't like it, uh, but I, I would say it's like training a puppy. You can't go in, like come home. You've been gone all day. Find <laughs> that your your uh, puppy has uh, you know, gone to the bathroom in the middle of the living room and then go find the dog and smack it. Like, right, exactly. That doesn't, it doesn't work, work like that. so it's well. Like, you've got to kind of like catch the dog in the act of, of doing that and then, you know, kind of like, no, 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 and like that, and then redirect it, redirect the effort around there. Right. But it's, yeah, so people didn't like that. I remember I used well, that when yeah, I was managing a team. There's like, so we're puppies that are wetting <laughs> the floor? Like, no, yeah, not exactly my, the my curb. There. You're right. But you no, and, and it's and it's the other analogy I had that was very much in line with that was, you know, SharePoint was the best dog show in the world. You know, it's the best dog and pony show where everybody looked at the window and said, I want that dog. But then they took it home and quickly realized it doesn't know how to fetch the paper. It doesn't know how to do things the way we do them around here. It doesn't know where the pad is. Right. Like you, you have there, to. There were definitely dog whisperers uh, in yeah. the SharePoint world that made it look <laughs> Oh, so fun. easily. And every demo makes it look so easy. And then and then you have to give the hard reality of the company that, you know, you, you really are a strange and unique snowflake, especially in unique snowflake, sorry. That's right. And we really are going to have to have some, uh, you know, it, it's not all out of the box. We can't just do what your competitor is doing and implement that here because you're a different organization with a different value chain, with a different, you know, set of, uh, you know, sales principles and a different culture, if you want to get into that. But but again, culture really comes back to what, what what's acceptable around here. Well, the fourth question was, again, uh, is strong overlap here, but what are your operational governance best practices for Microsoft 365? So, again, I'm, I, I always like to ask these questions that are kind of these broader f philosophical questions. And then I'm, you know, sometimes I'm like, what are your actual tactical? I like, how are you doing this? Uh, so what are your best practices in, in your org or with clients? And I, I saw a great one yesterday. It, it came through the LinkedIn channel, maybe it even it was a Jeff Teeper uh, comment, but it was, it was really about, you know, let's use my analytics in a positive way to help take the pressure off of these employee 360s, which are, you know, relatively falling out of favor, but you know, even better is to lead people towards this other information that they have. Let's, let's see what people are doing. Let's manage and management doesn't have to be constrained. It can be monitor. And it, 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 it's right. the best man, the best managers stay out of your way. And when problems happen, they come in and they help you clear the rocks. Right. Right. And that just means, um, you know, the way that Satya talks about following trends on Yammer, this is the pulse of the organization. And if something comes up that needs attention, this is where that first appears. And it's, 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 it's the same for all of the Microsoft collab technology. Use it to follow the trends to 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 to, to monitor, and 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 manages people not with always with policies and automation, because this tendency to automate every workflow and every process ignores the human side of it that that people get frustrated with because now I have this big complex process imposed on me, and I just need a place to do the work and somebody to keep an eye on it to make sure I'm not getting stuck. Yes, but Eli, listening to people, listening to your employees, that takes a lot of effort. 
<laughs> it does. And that, I mean, we'll come back to that in question seven, yeah. I think. Well, so, <laughs> but, yeah. you know, it's funny. Like I said, we've been doing the tweet jams for nine years now. It's uh, it, one of the things that I love about it is it's kind of exactly this. It's it's a great way to seek it. Like, what are the trends that people are saying? Like, does it validate some of my assumptions or my experiences? Uh, or, you know, it, it, or am I just completely like, that doesn't sound at all like what I'm experiencing. What are we doing right? Or what are we doing wrong? Right. Which is usually more the case. And that's yeah. what I say. I mean, like the features where I hope this goes is we, you know, the, the, people talk about maturity models every now and then and how to turn from a reactive organization to a proactive organization, right? And using the data. And I think the best thing that we can use are the tools that are already there to do that monitoring. Maybe it is DLP to sense or 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 uh, you know, cognitive analytics. Again, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but it all overlaps. Um, let's talk about sentiment analysis in 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 making that an easier job for the managers who need to do that 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 right. monitoring. But stay out of the way in the meantime and let people do their work. Well, I, and I think to add on to that, so and we got in a little bit of a discussion later, uh, and uh, you know, Eric Overfield is giving me a hard time. I'm on a I'm on a panel later with him today, but uh, about um, automation and how much that you can go and automate. And I use the example of like tagging. Well, we used to ask our end users to go and tag, and nobody ever did the tagging, or they didn't do it right. And so we should automate. And he's like, Oh yeah, how that that just solved everything. I'm like, No, it does like eighty percent. You still have the 20, but it's better than asking employees to do all 100% of that. So you monitor, you've got DLP, you've got other level of automation, sentiment analysis, all those kinds of right. things that's happening in the community. You still then need to have, uh, you know, surveys, um, you know, talk to people, uh, have conversations, ask about what's working, what's not working, um, ha have those feedback loops in place, have anonymous submission of issues, of questions, uh, you know, yes. a, a feature request, that kind of stuff. And then the third side of that uh, I uh, you know, am passionate about is having a transparent change management process. So people see, we heard you. Hey, yes. we disagree with you on these things. This is why we can't do that. Here's our compliance that conversation back security. and forth. But for the things you requested of these other seven of your 10 Here's the state of uh, of change of these things. We're trying to implement immediately a couple things, and that is so critical. When when people and I use this was the, I I shared this Buckleyism out there um, with uh, with Daryl Webster. I said uh, it's something I've a phrase I've used. When people are involved in the process, they're more likely to support the process. Only and consult so, the people you don't want to push back. <laughs> yeah, or that, you know yeah, I mean? yeah. like, right. and everybody because everybody you don't consult is going to push back. That's 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 the way it happens, right? Right. And so, it, yeah. It, anyway, so there's. I'm a, lot a facilitator. I'm not a designer. You know, in many states, I was just thinking about right. taxonomy design and, and how successful they can be. Also, and they're they're in those workshops. I, I just facilitate the solution. People come up with their own, and then they own it, and that's the magic of it. And any groups that you don't include and management will say, oh, after three, we know exactly what we want to do. And of course we do. But if we don't talk to groups five, six, seven, those are the ones that are going to push back. Right. Your experience the same? Uh, exact same thing. And it, it, it lessons learned, I started my career as a business analyst and a project manager, um, was that even if you're asked people like, are these all your requirements? Is this, Are these all the outcomes that we're driving towards and building towards? Um, then what happens is you get that first iteration of it. Then they go in and look at it and be like, I asked for all the wrong things. So if you're not refining that design, refining that model, where you actually end up, uh, it might be very different. I always use it as an example, uh, the classic and important film, uh, Spaceballs. Of course. Uh, where they jump to plaid, you know, they, they, like that whole thing. Uh, so basically the idea here is like two spaceships, one chasing the other. Um, if you've got your calculation slightly off a millimeter in your <laughs> measurement, um, no big deal if you're going a foot. But if you're going into hyperspace, yes. you're in a different galaxy at the end of that process. So you need to be adjusting your measurements uh, throughout. So... Yeah, visibility, 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 and process, process, process. I mean, it's I, I, I said also today that it, it's really not about people want me to plan a solution. They want me to you know plan for launch and know what's going to happen on day one. It's like no, no. Let's <laughs> let's 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 manage 
let's let's make sure this is adaptable and adjustable. Whatever we design, that's a process itself. Right. And we need to re redo that process every time, you know, every so often to make sure we're, we've still built the right thing. You know, and, and, and it's not for day one because then you're out of date on day two. You right. know, if it's content, if it's such, it's the process to create the process to so that people can follow the process and, and everybody understands life cycle. They understand governance. They understand how things change and not just how they work. You know, I know this is a different topic entirely, but you know, the, there's the reason why you know, management is that you know not every uh, you know good technical person should be people managers. Like it's a different art form, it's a different skill right. set. There are brilliant facilitators who can't manage their way out of a paper bag of a project, but get them up in front of a group of people and move everything along for that. They're just brilliant at that. Yeah. And so, yeah, but anyway, different topic. Well, question five, moving along here, was uh, how do you enforce corporate policies and content life cycles without discouraging collaboration within the enterprise? I think it's back to that idea of you want your train your custodians, let them know what it is, delegate that task, you know, help them understand what 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 the, what the way is. It, 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 back in the, the site owner models, it was very much about, you know, to become a site owner, you need to take a little bit of a training piece. And during that, you snuck in your governance for how things should work in addition to all the SharePoint-isms of, of how sites work. I, I don't think that's changed very much. You, you empower your people, um, delegate as much of that as possible, and monitor so that you see when people are getting stuck and they need to bubble things back up. You know, keep my uh, project management activities is, is understanding roles and responsibilities. I think that's also true about whatever the container is, the community that you're yeah. a member of, uh, is knowing like what's the purpose of this thing that we're here for. And then having owners in place, you know, to your point, owners yeah. in place that knows when people are going outside of what the scope of what we're trying to do here, and that you either redirect them or be like, you know, that should be included here and expand the scope and adjust there. That's, so it's, I, uh, I, yeah. I agree. I, I put out the idea today that, I mean, like, we've written so many government's documents and, and every conference has a government track, you know, that that largely becomes a dead document. Uh, we want these to be living documents, but they're, they never get the ownership of, of that you want them to, right? Right. So what's the better way to do it? And it, it really comes back to people and trusting your people. Um, but then having, again, that monitoring, the stuff that sits behind the scenes that act as those guardrails that 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 keeps things in, in the general direction that you want them to swim. Right. Well, question six, uh, s slight departure in, in theme there says, what tips can you share about making enterprise collaboration more inclusive and increase all uh, uh, overall engagement? Because inclusivity, and that could be, you know, however that's defined, and again, with know your community, but uh, like I brought up the fact that um, how people are accessing the community versus mobile device versus browser versus native app, it could be like, hey, are there uh, you know visual or audio needs with the community that you're serving, and and so you know how do you ensure again that you know, you are being more inclusive in how you're designing this community? Maybe it's because I see companies that already have some critical you know mass of. Um, social groups. And so whether that's a uh, a, a group that is for women, whether that's a group for buy and sell, whether that's a group, you know, with, with bulletin boards, whether it's a group that coordinates flu shots, whether it's a group that coordinates training, you know, it, it can it can move from the purely social into those business pieces. And I find that the, by, by getting people involved in, in what, the, again, those social groups that get ignored, those water cooler groups and the buy and sells, Management doesn't love them because they aren't the governance. They aren't the org chart. They don't seem to fit with that model. They don't fit with the revenue generation. And so I can't justify this as an income, but they need to be served and people need to do this. And I think that's where the more you can include people at the entry level, it's free training for the business purposes. And you you empower people to, with, on the tools to, to speak their minds and to form the the, the, the women, you know, of our, of Contoso, uh, you know, experience group. You know, I think it even goes to, uh, you, you know, when a lot of, uh, with Yammer and Teams, there's a lot of organizations that um, lock down immediately the use of emojis and stickers. Right. And, and, and I think that's, even then, it's just a, 
especially with younger generations that are used to uh, the various instant messaging applications and, uh, and and texting and those kinds of things. They're just you know uh, you know it's a it's a different language almost around there, but it it allows some people to be much more expressive around the you know their involvement in a discussion and things around there and and uh i mean obviously you want to have going back to those the guardrails the guide rails of right. you don't want people to be offensive and be sharing things that are inappropriate for the workplace but if i'm you know responding back to people and giving a little thumbs up icon or a a smiley face you know or or as i use more commonly the straight face like kind of Right. You know, you know that that <laughs> emoji. I don't know what you call that emoji. You know, right. uh, but but use that to express it, it. It it just adds again that that other another layer to um, the the conversation that happens within the community. One hundred percent. People shouldn't have to. You know, if you've seen Slack use in the organization and you've locked down emojis and Jiffy, maybe that's why. Right. And, and you're locking out millennials from from conversations. Um, what, what's, what's perfectly acceptable to, to some groups, not so much for others. And, and again, it's keep an eye on what's going, but stay out of the way of the work. And then when something needs to be discouraged, jump in and discourage it with a hammer. But let, let the conversations flow. You know, let, yeah. let people generate ideas and, 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 and be great. How do you ch- and challenge them to be great? You have the places too where I can, uh, you know, ideate and and contribute to. Here's how we can improve product. Here's how we can make our processes better. Here's how we can get bureaucracy out of the way. Here's how that workflow could be three steps quicker, right? And 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 really empower and encourage those voices. And if that means anonymous uh, ways to do that, do that also. Sometimes, now. right? Yeah, sometimes. Well, that's that's why you know having the there's value in having that even that just the anonymous employee feedback just like that box that's in the cafeteria safe, you know safe, have safe. a digital version of that right and and so well that's just like in managing people and getting feedback sometimes you know if you have a, a room of ten people three or four are going to be very you know vocal and and you know and you'll have some quiet people that you need to. You know, maybe just two or three of you, or maybe a one-on-one, or you send an email and they share something back, and it might be a day or two later after that. So you have to, you know, realize that not everybody operates on the same spectrum. Not everybody is comfortable in the same way of sharing their feedback. You've got to provide those multiple, you know, it's, it's, mechanisms. Agree. Like on, on so many of those sites that we gave, say, to the site owners, the custodians, to say, here's how SharePoint works. Here's how Teams works. Um, it was very much a how-to, and 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 less so a why. And I think exactly that thing about teaching the same things as you would teach your facilitators. You know, pull opinions out of the quiet people in the room because they're 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 as genius as the loud people. They just don't express it as easily. Right. So so you know those same tools where we think of just how to use the platform, um, extend those to these other ideas and think. Think of them as people, not as how do I how do I train you so 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 I'm automating my process through you. That's not what it's about. That's not where you get the biggest gains. Right. Well, our, our final question here, Eli. Uh, what feedback would you give to the Microsoft product teams to improve the community management and governance? So, kind of a broad question. Uh, the, we right. had a few Microsoft lurkers, so they're always interested in those questions. The way that I stage those. Well, and my, my feeling on that was you know, very much, let's keep on extending these cognitive services to these other platforms. I think with social uh, conversations in general, sentiment analysis can be very powerful, again, for taking that pulse and, and showing me where something is flashing orange or red. Um, and, and, and where it's flashing green and I can get new ideas and I can encourage those patterns in other groups also great things to watch. And 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 we're talking about pattern analysis, which is something that the, the cognitive services are great for. Right. So I think there's some natural extensions that I, I hope we, we we start moving towards there. And, and did you have any other, what were your ideas on that? I'm very curious. Well, I, as, especially know, as a third party, you know, yeah, now who, who builds com- tools for these Look, things. I made it, yeah, I made a comment about, you know, like, look, there's our, you know, both of our sponsors, my company, AppPoint, Tigraph, right. of course, with, it has analytics. Uh, and uh, I know one of the things that I always hear from uh, John and Ed at Tigraph, which is, you know, wanting expansion of the APIs. I hear that from my engineering yeah. team. You know, there's there's always that that ask. 
And I know, but I think that it's, you know, increasingly cross workload, being able to, um, uh, you know, and that's where, I mean, third parties are already doing this, but cross workflow and even, you know, this is beyond Microsoft, but cross cloud, the ability to go and create and manage uh, my users across, you know, um, the multiple clouds. I won't go get into name dropping of, of sure. what those where I think those are. But the reality is that there are very few organizations in the world that only operate within the Microsoft stack in every aspect of their business. Yes. There are other providers out there with other solutions and they need to all talk and work together. I think there's tremendous opportunity for partners and for companies to go and do custom work there. I mean, the other, if we've got better APIs around that, if we, well, here's the other thing I was gonna bring up. Uh, uh -huh. I think there's opportunity to go and, and build some really cool things. You know, with the the uh, all of the uh, hullabaloo around uh, the productivity score and Microsoft tracking you know, like that information, which fundamentally was people that didn't understand what it what it is and how it's used in the first place, thinking the worst. Uh, you know, hey, I can't believe this is being tracked. Be like, what do you think analytics reporting tools do? Right. So, <laughs> Precisely. Um, <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, not not that people can't go use information in the wrong way. And, uh, you know, look, there are managers If really if there's a manager that is looking in, see, I see that you had 57 messaging requests that came to you last month that you didn't respond to in less than three days. <laughs> right. You're, you're a crappy manager. <laughs> like, well, what are you doing? That was the weekend, and we had Monday off as well. I mean, you know. I, right, yeah, there are many, many, many cases for this. And it's like, it's, it's an out-of-office lesson. It's not a messaging or availability act. You know, right. it's it's a, uh, yeah, I mean, it would be curious to to talk to marketing groups in that sense, you know, and say, you know, what kind of analytics are, are you doing in, in our uh, social media feeds, and how can we turn that on our internal feeds to to do something similar? Because it's not just you know the 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 sentiment. It's it's all kinds of things that people are asking for. It might be suggesting new product, uh, you know, directions and such. And those come from inside as well as without, right? And especially inside is is you have people again in those edge communities like sales and marketing, that that observe what customers are doing. That also see what's happening on the inside of the company and and can bridge that. They would probably just as as well like to then influence back to the, the your product groups, your product teams on, uh, you know, what are you guys talking about? Where are we going? And and this is a great idea. That's that's a weak one. But how do they raise the ideas? How do they listen in on those conversations to, to understand the same way that they do on social media channels to understand customers? You know, it's funny how much things change and technology has advanced and, and that we're I, I find myself with, because I, I agree with you on that, but that brings me right back to where I started entering this whole space that got me into collaboration technology in the late 90s was around project management and building decision support systems and trying to learn from the patterns uh, in our projects, say what assets can yeah. be reused, what are the patterns as, as for a delivery team uh, that we're seeing frequently so that we can reduce the amount of time that it takes to take, you know, a solution to market or to to have a customer go live and kind of all those things. That kind of learning, that analysis, we're looking, it, yes, it's much more complex. The volume of content, it's just amazing. It's incredible to think about compared to what we were doing 20 years ago. Um, but the the desire of the kind of information that we want out of our collaborations is the same right and, and and again to come back to you even earlier we talked a little bit about maturity models and i think that this is also where microsoft can really follow if if you know the the lowest levels on that totem pole are ad hoc solutions and then very reactive it groups and i i, I reactive companies and then we get towards proactive and finally taking advantage of the information that we can gather yeah, um, Microsoft. I mean, that's really what they can help with. I, th I think companies need to realize: yes, if I add cognitive services, I probably still need to do some training. It's still some uh, uh, investment. There's so much you can learn from, like the history of Microsoft Search, by the yeah. way. In this. Oh, I mean, oh yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, oh yeah. Let's 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 learn from the data, right? And 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 use that to proactively guide things forward. There's, 
ongoing opportunity to learn from search and <laughs> right <laughs> but you know it's actually and you brought the maturity model that's something that so microsoft i don't know if you're aware of this eli but like uh so our, our good friend uh mark anderson mm -hmm. led part of the effort and it's a community effort around uh building documentation that's all up in docs.microsoft.com around the maturity model but right. that's a great place to go and look at for any company to see where where do i fit across the workloads what do I need to do to improve? Because yep. Microsoft is very much looking at it in the same way. Like if our customers are kind of at these levels, here's the baseline, how do we raise them up? And that, that's part of their strategy Precisely. with their R&D, their with their product development. And Mike 2, which used to be ECM3, and something that Mark, I think, is building on and sort of using as inspiration for some of these maturity model things. Yeah, very good guides, because not only do they help you scorecard yourself and where you are today, I use the ECM maturity models with clients all the time, especially with knowledge management. Yep. Um, but it, it, they also provide the guidance on how do I move to that next step and what kind of things can I look for to, 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 to get me there. Yep. But again, I think this is where Microsoft can provide those tools to, to make an organization, to give them the information that's already being collected so it doesn't become another initiative um, of a company. I don't have to build it, it's already there. I just have to dedicate some resources to understanding how it works, training that dog for my own house, and 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 then letting it be a great dog, you know, great, let it great, be a great service, right? Right. Well, Eli, I really appreciate your time today. It's great to finally connect and, and yes. uh, see your face again someday. Well, I'll be up back up virtual, in Toronto and virtual hugs. Yes, of course. Yeah, we'll see you at some event. But uh, anyway, have a great rest of the day and thanks everybody for watching. Thanks. Have a great rest of your week, people. All right, perfect. Well, I'll have the edit. I'll probably have this up live tonight. So I'll ping you via the socials when it's live. And now I got to go jump on a panel. So I'll talk to you soon. Likely. Client call, same thing. Thanks for yeah. the invitation and uh, glad it finally worked out. Take care, yeah. buddy. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye, Christmas.